The Avatar series is jam-packed with amazing benders that know how to use their abilities in unique and awe-inspiring ways. Sorry for all the Metal Lords out there, but you wouldn't stand a chance against these benders. Today's video is more of a celebration, breaking down some of the best benders we've ever seen in both Avatar series. I'll talk about some of their best moments, their best moves, and just how powerful a lot of them really are. So grab a cup of tea or some cactus juice if you prefer, and let's get started right now. We all know Toph is awesome. Without her, Team Avatar would never have gotten as far as they did in their fight against the Fire Nation. And she proved almost instantly why she was one of the best Earthbenders in the world with her unique fighting style. If you think being blind would hinder her in any way, then boy, I don't want to see you have to fight her, because she'll completely annihilate you. Toph also did what all benders should do, which is look for ways to improve. You might already think Toph was close to perfect, but really there is no cap on progress, and she certainly did improve when she did the impossible and invented a whole new style of earthbending with metal bending. From her discovery, earthbending was changed forever and had long-lasting implications for the future. Not even the Melon Lord could stop her. Yeah, including avatars in this list of skilled benders is kind of unfair. Of course they're going to be one of the most skilled benders. They have to be. They'd be pretty bad at their jobs if they weren't. But I think there's more to being a skilled bender and a successful avatar than just mastering all four elements. And that's where Aang comes in. Yeah, Aang is super powerful, and the quickness in which he mastered the elements is impressive. But I think what really makes Aang skilled is his ability to seek out alternative methods to victory. He wields all the power and yet strives for peace and that's oftentimes the harder route. When faced against his greatest enemy Ozai, Aang displayed unbelievable strength and skill both in and out of the Avatar state. And yet, even though all his past lives wanted to execute Ozai, Aang found another way and basically used energy bending for the first time. Good for Aang. Uncle Iroh is a fan favorite character for good reason. He was always there for Zuko, guiding him toward the path of redemption without forcing it. And although the early episodes made him seem like an eccentric old man who just wanted to drink tea all day, we slowly learned just how skilled a firebender Iroh really was. He not only could showcase the destructive power of firebending in really unique ways, Dragon of the West scene anyone? But he also had a deep spiritual understanding of the balance of the elements, and that made him a better bender overall. Yeah, Iroh is the one character who can give you sage advice, but then can also utterly destroy you in a fight. Yes, another avatar, but Korra is here for good reason. I know she's a divisive character with her headstrong and stubborn nature rubbing some fans the wrong way, but Korra deserves some major props for navigating her avatar journey mostly on her own. While Aang had a deep spiritual connection to his past lives, that was something Korra didn't have for a lot of her series, which forced her to grow and make decisions completely on her own. And watching her journey to become a better fighter and a better avatar was a real treat to watch, and really showed how skilled Korra actually was. Sure, she was a much more close combat type of fighter than the previous Avatar, but when the situation called for it, she could deliver a beatdown like no other. While he may not be as nuanced as his brother, Fire Lord Ozai is the perfect example of how destructive firebending can be. Sometimes you don't need balance or understanding to be a skilled bender, but rather you can get by on pure firepower and ruthlessness. That's what Ozai proved, and he could even go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Avatar. Sure, he was boosted by the comment that enhanced his abilities, but he already had to be a skilled firebender to wield that much firepower without being overwhelmed. Yeah, it's a good thing Aang took away his firebending, because he would always be too dangerous with his powers. To reach the level that Ozai was at, it took a lot of training and practice. It's no wonder why he was the final boss of the whole first series. Zaheer is one of the greatest villains in the Avatar series, and he really showed just how deadly airbending can be in the wrong hands. Like, he really took our breaths away. Whoops, sorry Earth Queen, poor choice of words there. But Zaheer is one of the most skilled benders not only because of his expert fighting style, but also his ability to fly. Once he was able to untether himself from any attachments, the villain was able to evolve airbending to the point where he could literally just fly around. That's so cool. And really scary since he's, you know, a bad guy. And sure, he wanted to cause chaos in the world, but that doesn't mean his plans weren't incredibly well thought out and organized. 
It was great that the universe was giving people airbending abilities again, but maybe they should have skipped Zaheer because the end result is quite devastating. Sometimes when I'm trying to sleep at night, I could swear I hear Azula's creepy music theme playing softly in the distance. And then I decide to turn on all the lights and stay up the whole night because Azula chills me to the bone. We saw two sides of Azula in Avatar. The first is the ruthless, cold, mercenary-like soldier who would stop at nothing to get the job done. And the second is the crazed, insane, banishment-happy princess who doesn't fight fair. Both of which are incredibly powerful and should be avoided at all costs. But when she was introduced properly in the show's second season, she immediately became one of the show's best villains. Not only was she incredibly skilled at bending, but she also had a knack for manipulating everyone around her, which made her all the more dangerous. It's oftentimes easy to think of waterbending as a peaceful bending style with its focus on defense and healing, but watching a skilled waterbender like Katara in action, and you know just how powerful the element can be. Throughout the series, we saw Katara grow into one of the best waterbenders in the world thanks to her own determination, her great teachers, dabbling with bloodbenders, and a ruthless hunt for the man who killed her mother. If you take all that and still don't see how Katara is one of the most skilled benders on the show, then you need to lay off the cactus juice. She's also incredibly quick thinking on the battlefield, and that's helped her out a lot in a jam. Just look at the way Katara beat Azula. She was able to trap Azula in one place, freeze both of them, and use that to contain the crazy Azula once and for all. Sure, there was a bit of a lull period where Zuko couldn't light his fire like he used to, but don't worry, he got his groove back after a dance with some dragons. For the longest time, Zuko's hatred of the Avatar fueled his firebending, which was pretty powerful. But after he turned good and became less conflicted, he had to find another source to keep that fire going. And after he reaffirmed his true destiny and was able to relight his spark, he became an even more powerful firebender that definitely rivaled his father and sister. Plus, as an added benefit, Zuko also proved how skilled he was with the blade during his time as the Blue Spirit. Sometimes benders rely solely on their bending ability to win fights, but Zuko is one of the most well-rounded fighters on the show with his hand-to-hand -hand combat skills. No doubt his fighting style helps out his bending style to make him even more powerful. When we first meet old man Boomy, he looks like a slow, broken down, extremely old man who seemed a few cabbages short of a cabbage cart, if you know what I mean. But then, when Aang chooses him to fight in the ring, we see Boomy's true strength. And we see he's one of the most powerful earthbenders ever. Not bad for a 112 year old man, right? Boomy was always an incredible bender, but his true skill really shined when he took back his entire city of Amashu single-handedly, using basically just his face. When Amashu was captured, there were many who thought that Boomy was giving up, but like any skilled bender, Boomy was ultimately just waiting for the right time to strike. <laughs> and when he did, boy, I would have hated to be a Fire Nation soldier then. And given how well he moved, I wouldn't have been surprised if he popped up in Legend of Korra, still alive and kicking butt. The first season of The Legend of Korra introduced a really scary and fascinating villain in Amon, who seemingly had the power to take away bending from benders. That already made him pretty powerful. But of course, the twist was that Amon was actually a waterbender who used an advanced form of bloodbending to block people's bending abilities. Though, here's the thing. Though he turned out not to be an energy bender, he was an extremely powerful waterbender. To know how to do that and to hide the fact that you're actually a bloodbender takes an incredible amount of skill. Anyone who has mastered bloodbending is not someone who should be messed with. And it helped Makerman one of the strongest villains the Avatar franchise has ever seen. Again, it just goes to show that you should not underestimate waterbenders by any means, or else it might result in your doom. I think it's safe to say that Avatar Kyoshi was one of the most popular avatars. I mean, you don't see the Roku warriors or the Aang gang running around, do you? No, you see the Kyoshi warriors. And sure, they're not just named after Avatar Kyoshi, but rather Kyoshi Island, but still, that island only exists because of Kyoshi in the first place. So yeah, Kyoshi rocks. What many people don't realize is how special Kyoshi actually was. Her mother was an air nomad, and her father was from the Earth Kingdom. 
So although she was an earthbender first and foremost, she had a lot of the air nomad culture and blood running through her. It's probably why she was such a successful avatar. Earthbending and airbending are directly at odds with each other in terms of style and technique. But by being a part of both worlds, Kyoshi really showcased how powerful an avatar could be. Kuvira was the Season 4 villain of The Legend of Korra, and she was a really interesting antagonist. Her main goal was to unite all the separate Earth Kingdom tribes under her rule in order to make the Earth Kingdom more powerful and out of the control of a queen or king. Yeah, that has problems, but you could see why this villain thought this way. And she wasn't one of those leaders who sat around and let her troops do the work for her. Nope, she fought any threat head on, and could more than hold her own. She even was able to mostly win against the Avatar in straight combat. Sure, Korra was a little off her game and distracted, but Kuvera used her skills excellently. And come on, who else could come up with an idea for a giant robot? Okay, I know the robot has nothing to do with bending, but I just wanted to mention it because it's so cool. It's a giant robot. When we meet Tenzin, we can see how much pressure he's under. While Aang was the last airbender, he only had one airbending son, Tenzin. And from what we learned in Korra, that created a really tough upbringing for Tenzin, who took it upon himself to preserve as much of the air nomad culture as possible. But on the bright side, he turned out to be one awesome airbender. Up to that point, we only saw the young Aang use his airbending. But with Tenzin, we got to see for the first time what it was like for a trained adult man to use the airbending in a mostly serious way, and it did not disappoint. Tenzin was a true force to be reckoned with, and the times where we got to see him shed his uptight mentor role and let loose a little bit were true highlights in The Legend of Korra. But while Tenzin had to grow up with the burden of being one of the last airbenders, thankfully his children didn't. He had three airbending children in the show at the start, and already, that's a huge increase in airbenders, right? But then the universe had to go and course correct itself by giving people airbending abilities. This helped provide balance to the world. One of Tenzin's children, Janora, got to witness this evolution and grow with it, proving just how special and skilled she really was. Janora showed incredible strength in her airbending abilities in Season 3, and even got her airbending tattoos to prove she was now a master. To learn all that at a young age is super impressive, and I have no doubt she went on to do great things in the future. Yeah, I hate to play favorites with Tenzin's kids, but yeah, Janora is definitely the best. The reason Suyin Beifong makes this list is because of how much she changed over the course of her life. We saw her as a young, rebellious teen that was heading down a dangerous path, but eventually she was able to turn her life around and start something really awesome. She is the founder and creator of Zaofu, which is a city-state composed of metalbenders and is referred to as one of the safest cities in the Earth Kingdom. Metalbending was always a great evolution from earthbending, but Su Yin really showcased the true potential of metalbending and all that it could accomplish in the world. Plus, Suyin was also the one who metal-bended the mercury poison out of Korra and saved her life. Which is incredible. Although she may seem more carefree than her stern sister, you should never underestimate Suyin or you might regret it. If you ask people what the scariest or creepiest episode of Avatar The Last Airbender was, most people are gonna say the Puppet Master. The Season 3 episode saw Katara and our heroes meet the mysterious old woman Hama, who turned out to be a waterbender who could bloodbend on a full moon. Now, we've seen more powerful bloodbenders later, but Hama was the first one to really show us how dangerous of an ability it could be. Someone like Hama, who was so consumed by vengeance, used the incredibly dark technique to get revenge. But she basically turned into a monster while doing it. That's what happens when you abuse such a powerful form of bending. Now, if you excuse me, I gotta go turn on all the lights in my room so I stop thinking about how creepy the Puppet Master is. I really have to give Minghua a hand. She really knows how to waterbend. Oh, wait, no, okay, very poor choice of words. Uh-oh, no, she's totally coming for me, isn't she? I'm sorry, Minghua. I think you're awesome. And she really is a cool bender, and an incredibly skilled one at that. We've seen some of the most powerful benders beaten because they can't use their hands to bend the elements, but Minghua looks at those benders and just laughs in their faces. She doesn't have arms, but this incredibly skilled waterbender doesn't need arms to be deadly. She creates these water whip tentacle things and crushes any opponent in her way. And she's the only bender we've seen like this. 
Normally, you need your arms and legs to bend, but more likely than not, Ming Hua uses her shoulder blades and back to bend the water, which sounds impossible, but it goes to show how much work this waterbender put into becoming so formidable. Pali is another one of those special benders who seem to have been born with some genetic mutation that makes them slightly different than regular benders. Pali is a combustion bender, and quite a skilled one at that. We saw a combustion bender in the last airbender show, but given how he was missing an arm and a leg, plus eventually blew himself up because he was dazed, he wasn't skilled enough to make this list. Pali is a different story though. She was trained since her youth to be an assassin before joining Zaheer and the Red Lotus, and her skills make her an incredible threat. There's not much you can do to stop combustion blasts like hers, which is why what happens to Pali was so brutal. Using some quick thinking, Su Yin wrapped a metal breastplate directly around the combustion bender's head at the last second, causing Pali to blow herself up. A jaw-dropping ending, but it shows just how dangerous combustion bending can be, and it's a wonder Pali lasted as long as she did. Zhang Zhang was one of the first good firebenders we met in Avatar The Last Airbender. It was clear Aang wasn't ready for this element yet as he ended up hurting Katara, but he did learn some valuable lessons from Zhang Zhang about the nature of fire and everything. And we know Zhang Zhang knew his stuff as we learned he was the one who trained the cruel Commander Zhao in the ways of firebending. It goes to show just how revered Zhang Zhang was in his early days and how different of a life he led now. And although Zhao thought he was a weak fool for becoming who he is, Zhao doesn't realize that Zhang Zhang actually became more skilled and powerful by finding a better balance in life. Firebending is about rage and passion, but you can reach an even greater height if you follow the path of someone like Zhang Zhang. Who do you think the most powerful benders are in the Avatar's world? Anyone on here we didn't mention? Let us know your thoughts down in the comments below, and be sure to hit that subscribe button for more awesome Avatar content like this. Thanks for watching CBR, see you next time.